vamos retomar uh, a segunda parte da conferência com a discussão de um painel que tem a ver com uh, a estrategização da comida e da energia, que não é uma coisa nova na história, pelo contrário, é <risos> uma coisa antiga, mas que está muito presente neste momento uh, e que tem consequências que ultrapassam bastante uh, o cenário europeu. Vamos ter connosco, um, presencialmente, uh, a moderar este painel a minha colega Ana Santos Pinto. Ela é professora de estudos políticos da Universidade Nova de Lisboa. Ela não gosta que o diga, mas eu vou dizer, foi a antiga secretária de Estado da Defesa Nacional por 360 e quantos dias? 370, 375 dias. Só, só, só me deixa dizer se eu disser desta maneira uh, e, e que acedeu e eu agradeço muito uh, o facto de ela ter acedido a moderar e também a falar e a dar a sua opinião sobre este painel uh, vamos ter connosco também uh, o, o Desigen Naidu um, Desigen Naidu um, Uh, volto a dizer, as bios de todos estão não só resumidas, mas têm um link depois para a bio completa um, no nosso website. Desigen Naidu, neste momento, é diretor do Programa sobre Riscos Climáticos e Segurança Humana em África, do Instituto de Estudos de Segurança, ISS, Institute of Security Studies, em Joanesburgo. Uh, muito obrigado, Desiguen, por estar connosco e ter aceito uh, estar aqui. Um, de longe, uh, do Mediterrâneo Oriental, no Líbano, uh, em Beirute, vamos ter o professor Ilal Kachan, a, que é professor de Ciência Política em Beirute, uh, e, uh, enfim... Um, para não propriamente divulgar um segredo, mas para dizer a razão de ser do convite, ele é um, um, um contribuidor regular para um, um, um site que eu recomendo, que se chama Geopolitical Futures, uh, e que aceitou, muito obrigado Ilal por estar connosco, o quarto membro deste painel também não estaria connosco presencialmente, mas não vai estar nem presencialmente nem online, porque ele mandou-me um WhatsApp há poucos tempos atrás, há poucos tempos atrás significa antes do almoço, dizendo que o presidente do banco, de que ele é vice-presidente, que é o maior banco de desenvolvimento do mundo a seguir ao Banco Mundial, que é o CAF da América Latina, ele é vice-presidente para a área do setor privado e é especialista em questões de supply e distribution chains. É uma pena não estar connosco, mas uh, tinha que acontecer. Em todas as conferências há sempre alguém que falta. Aqui está o nosso espécime faltoso. Uh, portanto, o Jorge Arbaz não poderá estar connosco. Uh, portanto, eu vou deixar uh, uh, o painel agora nas mãos da Ana Santos Pinto uh, e até já. Obrigado. Obrigada, Fernando Jorge. Boa tarde. Uh, gostaria de naturalmente começar por agradecer o convite para moderar esta, esta sessão, agradecer a participação de todos. Uh, depois da almoço é sempre uma das sessões mais difíceis uh, e se me permitem, eu estou a olhar para a plateia e vejo vários dos meus atuais e antigos alunos, portanto, muito obrigada por terem, uh, por terem vindo e por assistirem a esta, a esta sessão. Um, o desafio que, que o Fernando Jorge me lançou foi de alguma forma uh, com uh, um tema que tem sido muito mediatizado, um, na, eu não sei muito bem como traduzir a noção do weaponization, mas da utilização da comida, da alimentação e dos recursos energéticos como armas estratégicas no contexto do conflito da Ucrânia, ouvirmos um, aquilo que eu, que eu acho sempre muito importante termos em consideração, que são as perspectivas com outras localizações uh, uh, geográficas. Um, esta uh, a guerra que estamos a assistir na Ucrânia tem sido entendida como uma guerra local na Europa, mas com um impacto que é um impacto global. 
Eu creio que pelo menos naquilo que uh, a nós europeus uh, nos vai dizendo respeito, nós estamos muito fechados numa bolha, numa bolha que achamos que é a realidade uh, uh, de todo o mundo, uh, uma bolha que uh, é provavelmente analisada noutras geografias uh, como um elemento muito distinto, principalmente porque ao longo das últimas décadas europeus foram se habituando a Uh, atribuir a instabilidade e a insegurança a outras áreas geográficas. E hoje, aquele evento e a continuidade ao longo do último ano que provoca maior instabilidade e maior insegurança internacional vem do continente uh, uh, europeu, com uma diferença é que as sociedades europeias têm uma capacidade de resposta através do modelo social europeu e do Estado Social e uma capacidade de acomodação daquilo que tem sido os elementos de inflação e de taxas de juro que é muito diferente no resto do mundo, em particular em comunidades mais vulneráveis e países com menores níveis de rendimento. E este impacto global que nós falamos é um impacto, uh, desde logo do ponto de vista económico, uh, o aumento do preço da, das energias e, em particular, no caso uh, dos combustíveis fósseis, uh, uh, causa uh, naturalmente um, um afeta e causa, um, uma, por um lado, disrupção e, por outro, aumento nas cadeias de valor e nas cadeias de uh, fornecimento. Mas temos também a questão do preço dos alimentos, em particular os cereais e os fertilizantes uh, e depois todos os produtos que a eles estão relacionados porque há animais que se alimentam de uh, uh, cereais há um conjunto de produtos agrícolas que uh, uh, necessita de fertilizantes portanto tudo isso provoca um aumento em, em cadeia uh, do, do custo uh, de vida e eu gostaria de começar este uh, debate lançando uma, uma questão, um tópico geral aos nossos dois uh, uh, oradores, um, desde logo uh, perguntando o que é que pensam sobre esta designação de armas estratégicas, concordam ou não, veem ou não esta utilização da produção, da comercialização de produtos alimentares e da energia no contexto da guerra da Ucrânia, mas também noutras ocasiões em que tal aconteceu como uma arma estratégica por parte daqueles que as produzem e disponibilizam. E, por outro lado, como é que nós uh, podemos uh, trabalhar para assegurar o acesso de todas as comunidades, em particular aquelas que são uh, mais vulneráveis, uh, aos recursos mais básicos, uh, a alimentação, uh, a noção da, da, da energia, num contexto de crescente tensão política. Falaremos das alterações climáticas um pouco mais à frente, mas neste contexto uh, uh, perguntaria uh, aos dois qual é que é a vossa interpretação sobre esta desigualdade estrutural e a forma como se responde a esta uh, desigualdade estrutural. Eu começaria uh, pelo professor Hilal Kacham, que uh, nos acompanha uh, uh, no Líbano, e depois passaria uh, a palavra aqui ao Desigan Naidu. Professor Hilal Kacham, por favor, não sei se nos está a ouvir. Uh, I don't speak Portuguese. Are you talking to me? Oh, you don't have the translation. No, I don't. So I'm going to make the short uh, question for you in, in, in English. Uh, my first uh, uh, challenge, if you want to, to start this session, is do you agree with the assumption that energy and food are being used as strategic weapons in the current context? And how do you see this uh, um, necessity of providing basic resources as energy, food, or even water uh, in the context of geopolitical tension? And in your case, if you want to uh, provide this information on Middle East. Sure, yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you for the introduction. Uh, there is no question that Uh, Russia's war on Ukraine has uh, aggravated the, the food and energy situation, not only in the Middle East, but uh, in most parts of the globe. Uh, uh, now, uh, and uh, needless to say, uh, this 
I mean, food, especially uh, staple foods such as uh, grains and uh, legumes and uh, uh, cooking oil were used as a weapon. There, there is no question about it. But let me start saying that even before the Ukraine's war, uh, the Arab region has uh, faced uh, serious uh, uh, food uh, uh, issues. And uh, the Arab region's food crisis goes back to the 19... Uh, 70s. I recall back in 1976, there were uh, sweeping demonstrations in Egypt, in Cairo and Alexandria over uh, the government's decision to lift uh, food uh, subsidies. And of course, then President Anwar Sadat blamed it on communism and <laughs> people were poor and they took their anger and frustration uh, to the street. Uh, in 2011, Two years before the Egyptian uprising, uh, there was also an outburst of violence in Cairo and the military stepped in and 11 protesters were killed by uh, gunfire. So uh, the food crisis has been going on for many years, but uh, in recent years it has been uh, aggravated and Russia's war in Ukraine, on Ukraine has added insult to injury. It, certainly, it has certainly aggravated the, the problem. Now, uh, you know, the, the Arab uh, region extends from the Persian Gulf in the east to the Atlantic Ocean in, uh, in the west. Uh, given the serious food uh, crisis in uh, the region, at least 65% of the population are uh, below the poverty belt or are prone to poverty. Even in oil-rich Saudi Arabia, Conservative estimates uh, say that uh, at least 20% of the population are uh, uh, below the poverty line. Uh, out of the world's 17 uh, water-stressed countries, 12 are in the Middle East. Uh, the, Middle, the Arab region uh, comprises 5% of the world's population yet it receives only 1% of the world's fresh water supplies. So this explains the seriousness of uh, the water issue. And of course, if we are talking about uh, the water, a water crisis, then by extension, it applies to agriculture. Uh, Arab countries are not are net importers of grains, uh, cooking oil, legumes, even, uh, even meat. Uh, now, uh, this crisis covers most Arab countries, with the exception of the oil producing countries in the Gulf. Uh, of course, Algeria is an is a, is a is a, I mean, is a producer of oil, mostly uh, uh, gas, but yet uh, it is not an affluent country as uh, the Gulf countries, and there has been recently. Uh, food uh, riots, and the food riots in Algeria date back to the 1980s. Now, uh, what explains this food crisis in the Arab region? And of course, uh, what I will do now, uh, I will talk about the, the crisis, uh, tie it to poor governmental policies, and the energy issue, because, you know, without agriculture, Without uh, uh, energy, you can't have a viable agricultural uh, sector. Uh, and we'll also at the end uh, talk about uh, the extent to which these crises uh, affect uh, security and what would be the possible alternatives. Uh, well, as it stands, the situation looks uh, gloomy, and I don't know to what extent the Arab countries are uh, agreeable to uh, starting or initiating effective uh, policies to put an end to the food uh, crisis, which has become chronic. Now, uh, let me just give a few examples about the seriousness of the crisis. Uh, Iraq. Iraq depends heavily on uh, two rivers that originate in Turkey, Tigris and Euphrates. Uh, because of uh, uh, dam construction, 
mostly in Turkey and to an extent uh, to the tributaries of the Tigris uh, rivers that originate from uh, Iran. These two countries have been uh, involved in building uh, dams. And in recent years, uh, Iraq has lost about 60% of its water supplies because of water cutoffs, because of evaporation, because of uh, the heat in, in, in the country. Uh, and uh, it is expected that if Iran and uh, Turkey don't allow for more water flow into Iraq, in 20 years, Iraq's Tigris and Euphrates will run dry. So the Syria, the question is very serious in Iraq. And uh, uh, last year uh, alone, uh, uh, the crop, uh, the basic, I mean, the wheat crop failed and the Russia and the Iraq's agriculture went down by 50%. There was a decline of 50%. Uh, in both Syria and Iraq, these two contiguous countries, 12 million people have no access to water. And they have to get it from. Uh, they have to 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 carry water uh, to, to to fulfill uh, essential household and sanitary needs. Uh, now, if you take uh, the uh, Yemen, Yemen, sixty eight percent of the population is uh, poor, and forty percent of Yemenis go to sleep hungry. I mean, people uh, live there on the verge of. Uh, uh, famine. Uh, so, I mean, the, the crisis there uh, is really intense. Now, uh, uh, over the past few years, uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, the country, thanks to their oil revenues, uh, were able to uh, introduce to build 900 water desalination plants. But these water desalination plants uh, are mainly used uh, for household needs and for uh, uh, for drinking. And uh, it, these desalination projects have not been successful in providing for, uh, for uh, agriculture. So it is, I mean, this water is not really uh, viable for farming. So again, uh, in my in my opinion, there is nothing that the Gulf countries can do that will make them uh, uh, that will make them able to sustain their people based on domestic agriculture. There is no question that they will have to import uh, uh, food. In the Arab region, the Arab region have seventy million hectares of arable land. Uh, Thirty million hectares out of the seventy are in. Sudan alone. But Sudan is a poor country. And despite uh, its agricultural land, as I mentioned earlier, many people are, uh, are hungry. And the, situation, uh, and the situation in Sudan is getting worse because of the military government. Uh, now, uh, Arab countries have not been able to plan uh, for uh, regional organization in order, for example, uh, rich countries such as Gulf countries would invest in Sudan and develop its uh, uh, stagnant agriculture. Sudan alone is able to feed the, the entire Arab region uh, be, because of its rich land and they have plenty of water resources. Uh, Arab countries have not really been serious about resolving the water, uh, I mean, the water and food issue. In Iraq, in 2018, for example, the government spent $15 million on land reclamation. Now, for the next two decades, in order to balance its water situation and account for a more viable agricultural sector, uh, uh, Iraq will have to spend $200 billion. The problem of the Arab countries is that the regimes are more concerned about security than agriculture, water, and feeding their people. Uh, Arab countries spend, depending on the country, up to 20 times more funds on defense than agriculture. Uh, so this explains to us the magnitude of the crisis. 
So how, how do the governments deal with the situation? First, I don't really expect there is no question that the dire situation is causing political instability. But I don't see political instability turning into an uprising or uprising throughout the region. Uh, you know, we all know that the Arab uprisings uh, have uh, failed. And the latest failure was Tunisia, which for uh, a decade, most people assumed to be the Arab exception. It turned out not to be an exception. Uh, Arab publics are no longer in a mood for uprisings. They, they, I mean, their aspirations were defeated by the counter-revolutionaries. So what do the governments do? Uh, they deal with the food and water crisis on a day-to-day -day basis. They try to alleviate the situation, but they don't really develop plans in order to find radical solutions to a, uh, a long-term problem. Uh, Arab countries have not been able to work together. In as early as the mid-1950s, Arabs discussed uh, the possibility of Arab regional cooperation in order to provide for a viable agriculture and to satisfy the food requirements of their people. Unfortunately, the only uh, outlet or field of cooperation, the only successful cooperation among Arab countries, despite their outstanding differences, has been uh, security, intelligence, and defense matters. Uh, so when it comes to security, they cooperate. When it comes to, for, to addressing the needs of the population, they fail miserably. Uh, in uh, one of the problems of agriculture that requires immediate attention, but I don't really see much attention given by the governments to it. Uh, it is not only lack of water. Uh, you know, uh, Arab agriculture is uh, mismanaged. Uh, the international uh, uh, output per hectare is 3.6 tons. The Arab region, a hectare, provides 1.3 uh, 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 tons of uh, food. So here you have a, a below standard uh, agricultural uh, output. Uh, Arab agricultural techniques, watering techniques are still uh, antiquated. Uh, for the most part, uh, uh, farmers use, uh, uh, okay, uh, um, flooding agriculture, flooding agriculture, they squander scarce water resources and they use 40% more water than sprinkling or uh, drip uh, irrigation. And they have not yet come up uh, with a mechanism in order to improve the utilization of scarce water resources. Some of the techniques used in Arab countries uh, go back to uh, a millennium. And uh, the government, the governments everywhere have not really taken the matter uh, uh, seriously. You know, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, several Arab countries depended on uh, food donations by Western countries, especially the US, but this is no longer the case and countries find themselves compelled to deal with the situation. Understandably, Arab countries have meager financial resources, of course, outside the Gulf region, yet they don't know how to allocate the, their, uh, uh, their scarce financial resources and focus mostly on defense, as I mentioned earlier, than on alleviating the living conditions of the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, vou agora passar a palavra ao Desigam Naidu, uh, lançando o mesmo desafio. Uh, concorda, do you agree? that food and energy can be strategic weapons and what is your idea on assuring basic resources to communities in the geopolitical context? Uh, thank you, Anna, um, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, let, me, let me start from one of the first points you made, talking about inequality, uh, Antonio Guterres, in his Nelson Mandela lecture, right in the middle of COVID 
pandemic said that, in fact, the biggest pandemic in the world today is global inequality. And this is a grim reality for all of us. So even when we talk about natural resource shortage, we are finding ourselves that there are at least two different worlds that we have to look at. In general, the developed world and the developing world, but let's be clear that that inequality finds expression inside countries in the global south and the global north as, as we sit here. So the issue about inequality and in particular inequity is a very serious issue around natural resources. The second issue is that if we look at these basic commodities, these basic need uh, categories of food or nutritional security, energy and power, and the, the other in that triumvirate, of course, is water, let's be clear that these have been instruments of power from the beginnings of human civilization. These were, if you like, our first weapons, and we've never stopped. So um, Mark Twain famously said that whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. And this is indeed what we have done over and over again throughout time. We've just become much more sophisticated at it. Now, where the climate factor comes into the story is climate as a threat multiplier has indeed multiplied this threat as well. It has offered us a very focused, magnified view of how the dynamics of power work themselves through in water and in energy and in, in food and food access. And there are many factors that organize themselves to be able to be part of this in new and disastrously effective value chains around diminishing the ability for us to actually thrive as a global community of practice. And if one looks at things like the World Economic Forum Global Risk Register and the 2023 is a little bit different, but not that much different from the 22 and the 21. It talks to climate change as being the top four risks to the global economy over the next 10 years. It also maps out quite clearly how those factors organize themselves, which includes natural resource crisis, organize themselves through such instruments as migration to become, in fact, risks around peace and security in the world, risks to the economy of the world, and, of course, risks to destroying the social tapestry in the world. And, and this mapping is, I think, incredibly important. And the subject of this, this seminar uh, is the Indo-Pacific. And the Indo-Pacific is a theater of operation that pronounces itself extremely effectively around these factors. Whether we're talking about the prolonged drought episodes like there are in the Horn of Africa right now, where it's in its sixth failed monsoon, and this is in a triple La Nina year, when in general you would have flooding events rather than drought events, but here you have it. You have a continued drought in the Horn, or at the other end of the Pacific, California is now in its eighth or ninth year, depending on your interpretation of their drought. At the same time, you have rain bomb events in Australia, in the southern part of Africa. In the middle of all of this, we are seeing high energy storms, both in the Pacific as well as the Indian Ocean. We're talking about sea level rise happening simultaneously, drowning out, literally drowning out the island states in that region. And throughout all of this, we are finding a higher and higher scarcity of both access to food, access to fresh water, because seawater is not good enough for what we need to do as human beings. And of course, the energy crisis playing itself out in some of the most difficult ways inside this region. So let me talk to a couple of those aspects a bit more specifically. So one of the challenges in the Indo-Pacific around the power issue in the world and as exacerbated by the events in the Ukraine, the Ukraine has organized itself as a test point to the global philosophy around the move and the pace of that movement to a low carbon economy in the world. And frankly, the world has failed that test. It is said that our plans to move to a low, low carbon economy has explicitly 
as the motivation has been in the IPCC scientific reports. Absolutely explicit, unarguable from a scientific perspective that when we have immediate threats around some issues, in this case, energy and, and food, we will stop that bus, re-incur increasing debt in carbon, arrest our pathway to a more sustainable world because of an immediate crisis. But this crisis has reflections elsewhere in the Indo-Pacific in a very serious way as well. Because one of the things that it has taken back in the Indo-Pacific region, if I look at power specifically, is that the movements that have been happening, largely in the global south, but if you like the developing countries in the Indo-Pacific, around that movement to a low carbon economy, around winning the arguments for increased investments, for example, in ruin renewable energy. These are the JET uh, plans, the just energy transition plans in countries like South Africa, like Indonesia, like Vietnam, like India. Because of the sudden hunger for the fossil fuel asset by Europe on the back of the Ukraine war, we are starting to have great slippage of that in the developing South that the arguments that have been worn very big prices have been paid to win those arguments over the last two decades have had a serious backtracking when it comes to the Ukraine war. And once again, we are seeing one is the acceptance of the weaponization of water and food and energy, but now in a way that is reversing what was starting to become a really promising trend in that direction. And this is something we have to tackle and we have to tackle strong and hard. But let me make some specific examples around, we'll take water and maybe talk about food and energy a little bit later. One example of how this weaponization has disastrous effects, and I'll, I'll use only famous examples that you will all know about. And the other example is about how that threat can be used in the reverse direction. So the first example would be Israel-Palestine and the weaponization of water in Israel-Palestine. In 1967, at the end of the war, one of the very first things the Israeli state did is it took custodianship of all the water in that region and has controlled that water to the present day. The net result is that we have a phenomenon in the world now called water apartheid, where you have the Israelis with a much higher per capita access to water and the Palestinians with a much lower one. And, and the example that has made the news media quite in quite a pronounced way in the last year or so has been the issues in the Jordan Valley in the occupied West Bank, where the ratio now between the settlers' access to water in the occupied West Bank is 81 times that of the Palestinians in the West Bank. And there isn't only local beneficiation of that water. A fair amount of that water used by those settlers is to grow fresh produce for export to here. So Europe also plays itself out inside that game. It's a very destructive example. It's an example that violates the 2010 UN Human Right to Water and Sanitation Access uh, Convention. And something that I think we'll talk about for a long time. The other example that I'm promising is how you can use this positively. So if you look at the state of Singapore, and a lot of you will know the story of the transition of Tamasek to Singapore and independence. And when Lee Kuan Yew died, they ran this video over and over again in the global media of how he went to negotiate with Malaysia to become part of the Malaysian Federation and came back and cried on public television that Kuala Lumpur said no. But one of the things that came out of that is this new Singaporean state concentrated on its water insecurity, the weaponization of water in a different direction, around its reliance on those pipelines from Johar, from Malaysia. And on the back of that built in a phenomenal water security movement in the young state of Singapore to the point where we have the state of Singapore, which is now more water secure while having one third of what is considered the gold, global reasonable average 
of water availability for people and has organized for Singapore on the back of its water security to become an economic and industrialization powerhouse in the world. So yes, there is a weaponization of these commodities, but how we engage it and how we react to it can be the difference between potential prosperity or a continued despair. I'll stop there for now. Since there is no, I think, no available translation for uh, Professor Ilal uh, Kasham, I, I'm going to uh, speak in English to to make uh, um, a second uh, question, if if I may. Um, you, you describe very uh, clearly that the uh, scarcity of food and, and, and water and the great majority of population that is now above the line of uh, poverty is not related, of course, with the war in, uh, uh, in Ukraine. But you told something, if I well understood, that countries, and I assume that uh, governments as such, are more uh, preoccupied with security than with agriculture and with feeding uh, their uh, communities and their populations. But on the same page, um, you said that this current uh, uh, food uh, crisis, our high prices crisis, will not transform in appraising and in uh, severe instability in, in the region. So what I would like to, to, to hear from you, your uh, 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 interpretation is how long are um, it's possible for Middle East and Arab countries uh, as such uh, provide this kind of security, more a traditional security and uh, I assume military security, security of state, without feeding and providing their basic resources to the population because the alternative is uh, the community have a different legitimacy that it's not a state. It are different movements. And my question is, how is it possible beside this daily basis management that you talked uh, about how do we manage uh, uh, agriculture and, and the plants without structural solutions, how do you perceive these uh, developments in the Middle East uh, yeah. with geopolitical tensions and United States and China and all of that in the region? Uh, you know, uh, uh, the war on Ukraine has aggravated uh, the food shortage problem in the region, but it did not create it. You know, uh, the reason it really aggravated it was because uh, uh, one third of uh, Arabs' calories come from wheat. So, I mean, there's a very heavy reliance on grains to get uh, much of their caloric intake. Uh, now, I, I live in Lebanon. We have been beset by a very severe economic uh, crisis three and a half years ago. Uh, 90%, at least 90%, and that's not an exaggeration, 90% of the people are below poverty line. Uh, the people tried. Uh, we had a brief uh, uprising in September, October 2019, went on for a few months. Eventually, people realized that nothing will change. Nothing can happen. So uh, uh, they, they, they yielded. They, they resigned themselves to the situation. Uh, and the same thing is, is the, reflects what happens in the Arab region. When the situation reaches a critical, a critical point, the government provides life-saving measures just to keep people uh, at a level of subsistence, but they don't allow for uh, re resolving the crisis. They don't allow, they don't have a mechanism or they don't have a policy in order to uh, transform their countries and uh, uh, create a viable agriculture that would be, that would suffice the population. So uh, the, the, there, there, there are no plans. Uh, part of the problem, again, is the Arab countries' failure to cooperate. You know, uh, part of the solution to the crisis would require energy. I didn't say much about energy. Uh, you know, uh, a few months ago, we were without uh, running water 
for two weeks because the municipalities were unable to to procure uh, diesel to run uh, the generators to provide us with water. It was that bad. Now we get uh, fresh water every now and then, even though Lebanon as a country does not lack water supplies. It rains a lot in Lebanon, but uh, there is no mechanism for extraction and distribution of uh, water supplies. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and we, we also have a garbage collection problem, and not only in Lebanon, but, but in many places in the region. Why? Because to collect garbage, you need energy, and energy is scarce and expensive and the municipalities and local governments cannot afford it. I do not see a way out. I wish I can provide a, a roadmap, but again, to solve the problem of uh, uh, Egypt lost uh, uh, over the past three, four years, 25% of its uh, uh, water, Nile water, because of uh, Ethiopia's uh, grand, uh, 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 grand Renaissance uh, dam. And uh, uh, the government decided to ban the export of uh, staple food such as potato and uh, uh, and uh, other uh, food items in order to make ends meet. But there has been no no determined policy to deal with the roots of the problem. Uh, I I just uh, I wish I can come up with a solution. A part of the problem requires that these countries build desalination plants. But again, unlike the countries in the Gulf, they don't have the, the resources to invest in desalination plans. Again, desalination plans are not appropriate for uh, cultivation, for, 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 uh, for viable farming, and they are good for uh, domestic use. So the, the, the problems are, uh, are serious. I think, I think what Arab countries need to do is regional cooperation. And again, uh, the, the key to it lies in Sudan and Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries, the UAE, are investing in uh, in Sudan and they are also investing in Ethiopia. Regional cooperation that may also include African countries, Ethiopia and others, might deal with the resolution of uh, the food scarcity problem. You know, over the years, the problem with Arab countries ignored the existence of uh, an African neighbor, had they had they approached them and worked with them, and they could have developed their agriculture, whereby everybody would have benefited. So the problem the problem requires regional cooperation. But again, uh, the main concern of the regime is uh, security. Take for example, Egypt. Egypt is a country that does not have uh, the ability to feed the, uh, its people yet. Egypt embarks on massive uh, um, procurement, military procurement policy. They buy equipment that they don't need in order to placate the military establishment that runs the country and keeps the president in place. Thank you very much. Eu vou voltar aqui à sala, ao Desingham, e uh, recuperar uma expressão que utiliza, nós falávamos há pouco sobre isso, que utiliza na sua descrição uh, como uh, cidadão e profissional, que é um ativista para a transformação, um, eu vou repetir... <risos> Uh, eu vou repetir, falava que uh, na sua descrição uh, profissional uh, utiliza a expressão de ativista para a transformação uh, social e tem um enfoque muito significativo uh, na sensibilização para a questão das alterações climáticas. Na, na intervenção que fez uh, no início, uh, falava no movimento positivo uh, para as economias de baixo carbono uh, e que a crise na Ucrânia tinha um, um impacto impacto uh, significativo uh, naquilo que era esse uh, uh, movimento. E, e, e eu gostaria de, de lhe perguntar, em particular no caso do continente africano, e tendo em conta que o continente asiático, uh, designadamente a China e a Índia, precisam profundamente de recursos energéticos uh, e de matérias-primas, muitas delas vindas também do continente africano, como é que encara esta competição Ocidente, uh, para, para juntarmos europeus e norte-americanos e a dimensão uh, uh, asiática, olhando 
para um contexto de alterações climáticas e para o contexto do continente africano no que diz respeito a alterações, a, não só às alterações climáticas, mas à componente energética, água e alimentação? No, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. Look, one of the dominant conversations, or at least one of the useful new conversations that's happening on the African continent is how Africa can rise above being a place that other players play out the game and actually become a player in the global game itself. So Africa in the world, if you like. And there, there are some truisms that we have to engage. One of those truisms is that the industrialization of the North was done very largely on the natural resources that came from the South, and Africa is part of what contributed to that. It's African raw materials, it's African agricultural products, it's African fibers that enabled the North in general to become uh, developed countries. It is also true that a lot of the raw materials required for a renewable energy economy, a low carbon economy, are also on the African continent. In fact, Africa currently has some of the richest deposits of some of the rare earths, the lithium, the, uh, the, uh, the copper and the zinc and so forth that is required to power a renewable energy economy. And the warning comes from someone like Carlos Lopez. Carlos Lopez used to be the executive secretary of the UNECA, who said that you have a real possibility as Africa to once again power another global revolution, a low carbon industrial revolution, and still be left behind. So one of the things that we are talking about a lot on the African continent is how to organize to be a continued supplier of these goods in particular, not so much services yet to other parts of the world, including Europe and India and China, um, but at the same time organize for a beneficiation investment so that we become more than a supplier of the raw materials required to empower somebody else's economy. And I think we're starting to do some of that, not at the scale that we want to, but a reasonable scale to start. So we have these really big concentrated solar power plants like Ozazite in Morocco, and there are plants in Egypt, and there are plants in my part of the world as well. We have Namibia rising as one of the new leaders in the green hydrogen economy, and this is a very positive sign. South Africa itself is on a just energy transition project together with countries like Nigeria, who are not too far behind. So there are elements that are organizing for the African continent to actually play much more prominently in the fossil fuel, the non-fossil fuel economy. And this is a challenging thing for a place like Africa because Africa has put its bets on empowering the aspirations of Agenda 2063, which is our development agenda on the continent, on the back of that $10 trillion worth of fossil fuel asset that we have on the continent. So this trade-off has to be handled in a really, really smart way. And I think some of the political discussions that we're having around this are truly encouraging. So the UN, or rather the AU, the AU Peace and Security Council, in its last meeting at the end of 2021, met under the banner of the Climate Development Security Nexus. It took a firm appreciation that the security matters on the continent were seriously exacerbated by climate change, that climate change was in fact a serious threat multiplier, and this was just after the, the Mali coup d'etat. And it put into that mix this whole notion around how you can develop out new development pathways around this. So the African formula, if you like, these 54 countries that we have, 55 countries now with South Sudan, with very diverse, very different needs, trying to gel together a combination of continuing to service a global economy on the one hand with its raw materials while concomitantly developing ourselves as a continent so that we will no longer just be part of the supply chain. But we have some challenges. We have challenges internally, obviously, but the external challenges relate to the things we're talking about here. One, the global trade wars, particularly between the United States and China, but not exclusively 
between the United States and China really hurt what the African continent is able to do around its own development and becoming a serious global player. It's strongly related to a very fractured multilateral system. And some of the discussions this morning relate very directly to that, that organizing ourselves into multilateralism 2.0, the more effective one, is going to be absolutely crucial to go where we need to go, not just for Africa, actually. This is also true for every other place in the world, perhaps more so in the global south than the global north. But within that context, we're also starting to have some other discussions. Other discussions around things like, what does non-alignment mean in the 21st century? I mean, many of our countries have been actively punished for not taking what the West considers the right stance on the Ukraine. And it's not just about being annoyed that your countries didn't take a stance. It's much, much more than that. The threats are real. They're overt. Subtlety has gone out the window. And I'm not quite sure how we engage ourselves to get past this, this point. The countries that are seriously dependent on sector budget support have succumbed, and you've seen that. And other countries are hanging on the edge. So we need to have those kind of changes as well. So what I'm saying, Anna, is that there is a place that Africa and Asia serve in the world around the supply chain systems, and it would be foolish for us to cut that off. We are also well aware that there is a finite time associated with that. So coal exports to China will not happen beyond 2050. Because the Chinese 14 the basic plan, and this week you know that they're revisiting uh, their economic strategy on the back of a People's Congress, is quite explicit that their net zero target is 2070. The change in the spectrum of the energy mix will have a significant point of inflection in favor of renewable energies by 2050. So as an export market, that closes off. India has pronounced itself on a different target. The target is 2060. And I think those two countries will actually meet their net zero targets in a fairly accurate way compared to many of the rest of us. The second thing that we know is that the ICE is the internal combustion engine uh, timeline. Europe has pegged it to 2035. Maybe the more realistic point is 2045, but that's the end of that story. So all of those come into our equation around our own diversification of our economic foreign policy, if you like. So it's about honoring the current agreements while simultaneously empowering us through the dividends of that agreement into moving ourselves into a low carbon economy. And one of the new rules bases that we're engaging on the African continent right now are the rules for the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And this is where some of the early pronouncements on these issues hopefully are gonna be made. Thank you. I would like to go back to, to Professor Ilal Kashan and asking, and, and I cannot uh, avoid this question, that is the Arab countries' uh, position uh, regarding the war in Ukraine. So how do you see, how do you interpret it? this Arab country's position regarding the war in Ukraine, particularly taking into account the confrontation between the Atlantic Alliance, uh, Russia, and uh, China's position, and a difference that you already mentioned between the countries that are producers and exporters for oil. I uh, recall that Saudi Arabia, in the context of OPEP, united with Russia regarding the oil prices and the others that depend on these oil resources and do not have the same autonomy or the same uh, revenue. So how can you present us and... and um, make your analysis on this Arab country's position regarding the war in Ukraine and this triangle, Atlantic Alliance, Russia and China. Yeah, thank you. You know, most Arab countries prefer to keep quiet on what goes on between Russia and Ukraine. But if you ask me what I think, uh, most Arab uh, leaders 
uh, feel closer to Putin. Uh, let's remember, right after uh, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul in 2018, and when Mohammed bin Salman was attending the World uh, 20 Economic Forum in Buenos Aires, everybody avoided him. The only leader who came to him and gave him five was Vladimir Putin. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, we live in a region governed by, ruled by autocrats and autocratic leaders in my region uh, prefer to deal with Russia and they are not in favor of seeing the spreading of uh, democracy, you know. Uh, you know, Tunisia seemed to have a workable democracy until the coup two years ago. Uh, conservative Arab countries uh, uh, worked hard in order to defeat Tunisia's democratic experience. So I wouldn't be surprised why, I wrote actually a piece about it last year, why Arab leaders feel closer to Putin because he is one like them. Thank you very much. Um, Desigan, I, I'm going to use, uh, avoiding the translation, <laughs> I'm going to use more or less the same question, but picking on something that you just said on your last intervention and before we pass the questions to the public. Um, you raised the question, what does it mean to be a non-aligned in the 21st century? And in the case, the current context, uh, what does it mean and how can you interpret uh, and, and reflect on the positions, uh, not only in the case of South Africa, but being in the middle of this competition uh, and taking very seriously the consequences, what does it mean uh, being unaligned in 21st century? I think that's an important question, and and, and and let me let me engage it with a with a couple of reflections. Firstly, coming from a country that was at war with itself for a long period of time through an apartheid period, there and a country whose liberation movement very seriously considered an armed struggle in the worst possible sense. South Africa has a huge aversion to military conflict, particularly because this was a feature of the apartheid government in my country, and that apartheid government actively militarily destabilized all of the frontline states around us. So the first response to something like the Ukraine is an aversion to war. Is there a way we can end this? Can we use the mechanism that we used in our country, which was negotiated settlement, as a means to be able to engage it? And South Africa expressed this position very early on in the process. And when I talk about being punished, well, the responses that came, and they came thick and fast around threatening the withdrawal of aid, threatening the closure of certain agreements by several capitals around the world, it wasn't just Washington, the several European capitals as well, has been that response. But you know, South Africa and now the African Union has generally taken that as the right way to proceed. That we do not have the military means to engage in such conflict. That if we did so, would have a very difficult narrative for us to contemplate on the African continent. So the right way in which for us, for us to be able to proceed in a reasonable enough way, recognizing the hardship of an invaded country, we have complete sympathy with that, is to continue to push for a rationalization of the engagements around Ukraine towards having a more peaceful settlement. The possibilities of that are not easy. It was talked about in the first panel. Sinan talked about Turkey's role around this and the issues associated with that, and they're very real. So it isn't just about the very old alliances that sit in our part of the world where we have seen the role of countries in the West around perpetuating 
a particular model and the role of countries like Russia and China who were very intrinsic to the liberation uh, struggles in many African countries. And yes, to some degree, there is an element of that lens that's used in the discussion, but that's not the primary analysis. The second point to put on the table is this recognition that the Ukraine is a battlefield, but it's no longer Ukraine's war. And what that means in the broader perspective, and this was pointed out in the two previous panels, actually, around the whole notion of what a proxy war means, means that you're going to have a very difficult uh, possibilities of solution around this. And I think that the discussion is becoming more nuanced. I think we are talking a little bit more, and I think that we're understanding one another a little bit more. But the thing that's becoming increasingly obvious for smaller countries in the South, I'm not talking about superpowers like, like, like India, for example, who are in a position both economically and militarily to make other choices. But for the rest of us in the global South, a revitalization of a new non-alignment policy until we can organize ourselves to have a better gauge on how the settling happens, particularly between the United States and China. But they're not the only two powers engaging in, in, a, in a struggle for a new global order right now. So that we can find the right ways to both constructively contribute to this global peace that we want to see on the one hand, and organize for the least collateral damage and possibly even benefit for developing countries in the global south at the same time. Uh, so maybe, maybe it is that point in time, maybe it is that time in history for us to revisit what Bandung 2.0 can actually be. And I can tell you there are several players in the global south that would be rather enthused with the idea of engaging that concept. Thank you. Thank you very much. E como eu disse há pouco, vamos já passar para as questões da audiência e, portanto, espero que este, estas intervenções tenham provocado uh, uma tempestade nos vossos cérebros e provoquem também uh, uh, questões para os uh, uh, nossos uh, oradores um, e, portanto, pedia uh, à audiência que uh, lançasse as questões uh, para, se for necessário, posso depois fazer a tradução, uma vez que creio que o professor Hilal não tem a tradução para português, um, mas quem quiser, por favor, um, o palco é vosso agora. Não, I have, I have it now. Oh, you have the translation. Ok, thank you. Este é aquele momento em que toda a gente aguarda que alguém faça uh, a primeira questão. Aqui à frente, por favor. Olá, muito obrigado pelo, enfim, pelas ideias disruptivas que nos obrigam a refletir disto de outras formas. Tenho aqui duas, duas questões... Uma delas, em respeito aos objetivos que a União Europeia colocou em termos de metas simultaneamente de proteção e diversificação energética e de proteção ambiental. Porque uma das formas que a União Europeia encontrou para tentar de imediato diminuir a dependência energética da Rússia foi não só procurar outros fornecedores, mas também fixar novas metas, novas metas de utilização de energias renováveis. Antes de 2022, tinha prevista uma redução das emissões poluentes em 40% e atingir 32% das energias renováveis. Agora, isso uh, subiu para 57% na redução das emissões e de 45% de utilização de energias renováveis. Por um lado, queria saber se consideram que isto é credível num contexto em que são precisos muitos investimentos, num contexto em que, por exemplo, a China produz eh, 70% dos painéis solares do mundo, e num contexto em que as unidades dos países europeus eh, anunciam, ou já 
programaram aumentos significativos dos orçamentos da defesa. Portanto, estava a saber se consideram ou não isto credível. Por outro lado, para os nossos dois amigos estrangeiros, não vou pedir a Ana Santos Pinto para comentar, mas se o quiser fazer, bem. <risos> Como é que veem que não se discuta num contexto de acentuar de crise alimentar no Sul a ausência de discussão sobre a política agrícola comum? Porque há muitos anos que nós vemos do Sul, digamos assim, o Sul global, a dizer que um dos problemas que a União Europeia lhes colocava na internacionalização económica e que prejudicava o desenvolvimento era a perpetuação da política agrícola comum. Isso não se discute no último ano. Qual será a explicação? Como é que vem isso do Sul? Muito obrigado. Falando em perguntas provocadoras. Ali, por favor, aqui. Thank you. Um, I have to say that was a astonishingly lucid presentation and discussion, so it's uh, actually hard to think of a question. Um, I have a question for the panelists and also one for the moderator. For the panelists, my question goes to the disruption of the former export patterns of Russia and Ukraine in the area of agricultural commodities and foodstuffs in which they were preeminent in the world. And of course, the Global South, particularly uh, Africa, but perhaps also the Middle East has benefited from uh, imports of commodities such as wheat from, from, uh, from uh, these two countries. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, we economists uh, tend to be aware of is that when a country's trading links are disrupted, they are usually disrupted for a very, very long time. It's very hard to expect either Ukraine or Russia rapidly regaining the markets they had before. So, but my question is not about those two countries. It's about the impact on the global south, specifically your two regions, Uh, and the balance of gains and losses, poor people perhaps have suffered as they countries scramble to find alternative sources of imports of the vital products that used to come from Ukraine and from, uh, and from Russia. So that was my question to panelists. How, has the, how have ordinary people in Africa and in the Middle East um, uh, been impacted, have some benefit, who's benefited, who has not. For the moderator, my question is a very simple one. Uh, I noted that you referred to the confrontation between Russia on the one hand and the Atlantic Council on the other, Atlantic Alliance on the other. And this morning, it seemed to me that we had a very strong state fully aligned with the Atlantic Alliance and the United States but not from a member of the Atlantic Alliance, but from Japan. So there are countries that are fully allied with the United States and Europe, but they are not from the Atlantic. So I was wondering whether you would want to still use that phrase, or is there a wider phrase that, uh, that might be appropriate, given the idea that you wanted to pursue, which is a very legitimate one. Thank you very much. Eu não sei se há mais questões. Ah. Um, boa tarde. Um, eu não resisto. Um, Desigem e um, alal. Ah, um, Global South não existe. Afirmo. É uma afirmação. É uma invenção uh, que não tem nenhum conteúdo do ponto de vista geopolítico, do ponto de vista geoeconómico, do ponto de vista económico. Como é que nós podemos colocar no mesmo saco a Índia, o Paquistão, a África do Sul, o Egito, 
a Nigéria, todos estes países têm interesses próprios, muitas vezes divergentes. Global South é um saco de gatos. Número um. Número dois, estamos a ignorar um processo que começou nos anos 90 e continuamos a fugir para a linha criada entre o Norte e o Sul no final dos anos 70, entre países industrializados e países em desenvolvimento. Quando, na verdade, a grande clivagem não é geográfica, é de classe. Porque nos últimos 30 anos, e há estudos que o comprovam, estudos muito recentes, diminuiu o fosso entre os países e aumentou o fosso económico dentro dos países, entre ricos e pobres, entre quem tem mais rendimento e quem tem mais riqueza e quem tem menos rendimento e menos riqueza. Portanto, esta história do Global South é uma forma de quem tem o dinheiro de se esconder. Porque quem tem o dinheiro é que está aliado neste momento do ponto de vista global. Quer no Norte, quer no Sul, quer no Leste, quer no Oeste. Portanto, eu quando vejo a revisitação de Bandung 2, do não alinhamento ou do Global South, fico logo arrepiado. Porque significa uma falta de análise do que é que se tem passado no mundo nestes últimos tempos e, de certa maneira, uma certa colocação dos factos tal como eles são. Se nós olharmos estatisticamente com dados, qual é a região onde existem maiores desigualdades de rendimento e riqueza no mundo? É, número um, a América Latina. Número dois, a África Subsaariana, em 2022. Como é que estamos, podemos estar a falar em Global South e Global North, quando o problema está no interior de cada um dos países e as elites globais estão todas ligadas entre si? Eu penso que isto é uma maneira errada de colocar as questões. E não podia deixar de exprimir esta opinião, pedindo a vossa opinião também, porque acho que é um conceito não só errado, mas é um conceito que esconde a realidade. Obrigado. Eu se calhar vou... Ah, temos ali mais uma, uma questão, por favor. Nós se calhar fazemos uma segunda ronda de perguntas, para não juntar tudo. Eu já fiquei aqui com nota de mais uma questão. Boa tarde. Mas eu já fixei as outras duas para voltarmos na segunda ronda, por favor. Eu queria só dizer uma coisa. Este conceito de problema, eles muitas vezes querem... Este conceito tem um problema, é que muitas vezes querem explicar uma coisa e não conseguem. O conceito de global tool, eu considero que é incorreto, mas também considero, de outro modo, correto dizer que vivemos num mundo em que as desigualdades dos países se atenuaram substancialmente. Não é verdade. Isso não é verdade e as estatísticas, os números podem ser torturados, como muitos países querem, mas isso não é verdade. Continua a haver um profundo, uma profunda desigualdade entre os países, seja norte, sul, este e oeste. Portanto, isto dizer, também não serve para branquear. A culpa dos dirigentes, que haja um desequilíbrio entre ricos e pobres, mas culpa também das elites países onde não há estas desigualdades e que contribuem pela sua associação aos dirigentes dos outros países para que elas existam. Portanto, nós temos de ter a modéstia e não temos de ter este preconceito ocidental que eu acho que às vezes nos enferma o espírito e nos talha o raciocínio, que é pensarmos que neste pequeno cantinho do mundo em que nós nos encontramos, que é o que é de facto um pequeno cantinho, temos as soluções e a moral os problemas. E a guerra da Ucrânia também demonstra isso. Há moral de um lado e há imoralidade do mesmo lado também. Portanto, eu acho que é um exercício de humildade que nós, europeus, devemos fazer. Vamos então passar para uh, as respostas e eu agora vou inverter. Vou pedir primeiro ao Desigan que, que uh, 
conteste, responda, comente uh, os vários uh, pontos e depois passaremos para o Hilal Kacham. Uh, Desigam, por favor. Thank, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank, thank you for those very interesting and challenging questions. Uh, I think dinner is going to be very exciting tonight on that last question. Um, and and before I forget, and, and before Hilal answers, I, I have a small question for him as well, if I can add it. Uh, Hilal, it might be useful for you to comment on that cradle of humankind that, if you like, gave us the first innovations around water and agriculture, now being that part of the world that is undergoing such difficulty both on water and food security. It would be really interesting to get, get your take on that. But, but on, the, on the questions that have been raised, firstly on this, on this issue on the energy diversification, uh, let, let, me, let me confess my other hat. Uh, I also belong to the Presidential Climate Commission in South Africa. And with that hat, push very strongly for local energy diversification as well. I mean, uh, we are in fact custodians of the just energy transition in my country and are helping a lot of other countries to move on that pathway also. And with that hat on, we can't transition quickly enough. The reality is that even with places that have very low emission contributions like Africa, if we don't help to push those mitigation targets much, much more aggressively, the reality is that we are currently experiencing the vagaries and the extreme disasters associated with climate change in a way that we cannot cope. There is a but though, and that but is that those that have been responsible for the historical emissions, yes, China currently is the largest emitter, but on historical emissions, which is the largest part of our current problem, we know where they came from. And those countries should be obliged to organize for the entire world to move into a low carbon economy, one, and two, to have sufficient adaptation measures for us to actually minimize the loss and damage and be able to survive in this 21st century. And the inability to move on a very modest target, frankly, of that $100 billion is not something that's easy to digest. We have to have this global movement. Because imagine if Africa, the youngest continent in the world demographically, the one that will be the most populous continent in the world by 2100, some speculate with new modeling a lot sooner than that. Imagine if Africa does not make the transition to a low carbon economy. Imagine if the most populous continent on earth and the most youthful continent on earth decides that the only way it can survive is on the back of a fossil fuel economy with much higher emissions than we currently have, then that's it. That's curtains for the world as a whole. That's the existential crisis that's been realized. So it isn't a generosity one is asking for. We're saying that we're all actually in different classes on this boat, I accept, but that same boat is what's floating on this ocean and that boat is sinking. And if we can prevent that sinking by actually holding hands and getting the investments in the right place, then we can all come out of this in a much better place. So I, I, think, I think that's where we have to, because the reality is that Africa, like most parts of the developing world, have a strong desire to move to a low carbon industrialization pathway. The ability to do it and the investments to do it simply are not there and we have to engage it. That's, that's my view. The, the second thing I want to address um, is, is this appropriation of larger and larger amounts of money for defense and, and militarization of the world. In this case, where the disbeneficiary, if you like, is our ability to transition to a low carbon economy. We, we were having the same discussions 
around nutritional security and water access and access to all of the SDGs and before that, the MDGs and before that, Agenda 21. And we don't seem to have made much progress in it. The reality is that the military industry complex has a particularly pivotal trump card that's played out in most of our countries, not all of them, that we simply have to get behind. Because the reality is that the defense spending, or I would argue in some cases the offense spending, is denying us the possibility of the kind of sustainable development that we want. But more importantly, we're organizing to use money now for defense and offense spending that we're borrowing from the next generation and the generation after that. That's who's paying for the decisions that we make today. And I think we need really, really need to revisit that. The, the, the issue of the, the 70% of the solar components coming from China, I mean, there's an interesting nuance around that. I mean, I wrote a piece not too long ago about something titled the race to net zero. And it was an analysis of both IRA, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US. And the Inflation Reduction Act is quite interesting for me because it's one of three bipartisan acts that went through Congress that all form a really interesting S-curve around, around the US's own trajectory towards a renewable energy economy. The two others being the Infrastructure and Investment Act and the, the thing that's called the CHIPS and Science Act before that. And comparing that to what's happening in China right now, I mean, China is in its 14th basic plan, and it has the target to have more than 1,000 gigawatts on solar and wind at the end of that basic plan. And this is just on solar, wind, onshore and offshore. So this race of two gigantic economies, the two biggest ones in the world right now, around organizing for a transformation of their energy systems and industrialization systems to low carbon, possibly has a very good impact for the rest of the world. As it happens, India is not too far behind that curve. And I, I think that's something quite interesting. Is it useful for one country to have such a monopoly? No, it's not. Is it useful for big economies to be driving this movement to a more sustainable development formula for the world? I think it is. We would like them to carry the rest of us with them. Uh, but even if they don't, that movement is going to redefine what the landscape is going to be. There's some very interesting questions for Europe associated with this naturally, and, and maybe we can pick that up uh, a little bit later. The, the next thing I want to address, if I can skip, is to my my Desi friend from Bangladesh around the disruptions of the food chains. You know, this is something that's happened a few times, and I think we missed important opportunities in the previous times because we went into a survival mode around this. And who can argue against a survival mode? But the other thing that we continuously talk about and don't use these kind of opportunities for the scale-up is around things like diversification of staples, around return to indigenous crops, but now it's scale. And the science is telling us that is pretty accurate. One is those indigenous crops, indigenous cereals, as well as leafy greens, both have high nutritional content, use less water, and are more climate resilient. So a small part of what we do in the reaction to these crises is to organize for us to be able to shore that up because the world as a whole generally produces much more food than it needs, but the food waste in many places in the world organizes for us to still have what Fahl calls in his latest report, empty plates all around the world. We genuinely have the ability to have no hungry people in the world. We need to use these moments to make that big switch around where we need to go. Let me try to to engage Mfundisi Cardoso's question. Mfundisi means teacher from my part of the world, and I respect you as such. The term Global South is like the term Sub-Saharan Africa. Exactly. You'd have to really explain why it exists. <laughs> and in your criticism of the, word, the term Global South, you actually use the term Sub-Saharan Africa. 
the first ring tonight's on me, by the way. I, I think it's true that we have to unpack these things. I think we have to put them where they belong. Yes, indeed, there is a global north, a north in the global south as we speak right now. And there is a global south in the global north as we speak right now. There are very wealthy people that live in my part of the world in the midst of very poor people. There are also 70 million people on food stamps in the United States, which is the largest economy in the world. That is a reality. But if talking about the global south offers us an opportunity to rally the developing countries into an accelerated impetus around development, not development just to compete with other countries in the world, but development to organize that none of our countries have poor people, that none of our countries have people who don't have access to basic needs, that none of our countries don't organize themselves so that 100% of those peoples in those countries have access to the basic securities, then I'm happy to ride that wagon with all of the criticism that it brings. I'll pause there. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to, vou passar a, a palavra a, novamente ao, ao Líbano. Um, Hilal Kasham, não sei se quer reagir, uh, responder a algumas das questões ou a todas as que foram levantadas. Well, uh, several questions were raised, uh, but I have an attention deficiency. <laughs> I, I, I will uh, talk to the best of uh, my recollection, and uh, if addressed with direct questions, I'll be more than happy to, to answer. Uh, you know, sp speaking of uh, Arab countries' reliance on uh, staple food from uh, Russia and Ukraine, we know Russia and Ukraine uh, export 15% uh, of the world uh, grains and, uh, and oils. However, they are close to the Middle East and shipping costs are, uh, are not as expensive as other parts of the world. And also their prices are uh, somewhat uh, lower than other uh, food exporters. This explains why these two countries have been uh, important for Middle Eastern countries and why uh, the war in Ukraine aggravated the, the food crisis in uh, the region. Uh, Now, uh, uh, I don't recollect the other questions because there were so many of them, but I'll be very happy to address them now if, if presented to me. Eu sei que me foi dirigido. If you don't mind, I'm going to ask for your question. Uh, I'm going to ask yeah. uh, to answer in English for the yeah. Russia Atlantic Alliance question. I stand with the Atlantic Alliance because I think ontologically on the nature, the competition of the war no. by Russian regime is not with G7, is not with industrialized countries, is with the Atlantic Alliance. And probably Japan was one yeah. of the few that uh, United States, uh, Canada and the European states could convince on this package To, to answer the Ukraine, so I stand with the Atlantic Alliance. Uh, passando para português, yeah. o Fernando Jorge deu uma ordem expressa de terminar a sessão às quatro e um quarto. Mas o Fernando Jorge sabe que eu sou uma pessoa que não gosta de cumprir ordens e não tem um problema estrutural com a autoridade. E, portanto, há duas perguntas que estavam penduradas uh, e que da ronda anterior e uh, eu vou dar a palavra primeiro a uh, esta senhora que está aqui na fila com o casaco bege, por favor, aqui deste lado, e depois aquele jovem ali daquele lado, por favor. Pode ficar já aí o microfone e depois passa aqui para este lado, é igual. Aí, essa senhora, aí, não tinha pedido, não, não. Jovem, por favor. Hello, um, 
My name is Daniel. Those were great presentations. I'm a student of international studies. I think my question was more or less already answered, so not really necessary, I think, but was um, more um, if you are optimistic that um, that the West will really help um, uh, developing countries and poor countries of the world develop in a sustainable manner, if that is really the West's interest or will they just um, be more um, selfish and not help other countries. And also, if you think that uh, it will be possible to have great cooperation on climate or progress on climate and sustainable development, even among the great tensions that exist in the world today and seem to be on the rise. Thank you. Obrigada. E vamos aproveitar para uma declaração, digamos assim, tão curta quanto possível final. Uh, começo aqui pela sala. Desigam, por favor. Uh, Daniel, thank, thank you very much for that question and, and good luck with your studies. Um, I, I have an affliction uh, that I should declare, uh, a terrible disease. I'm one of those people who shook Nelson Mandela's hand. And when you do that, uh, unfortunately, you're plagued in your life with optimism. Um, so that is my affliction. And based on that optimism, I do have a belief that it will take time. It's taking much longer than it should. We should have compounded that global solidarity that we had in the 90s. And we just thought it was going to last forever. And it didn't. But there has to come a point of both this global solidarity kicking in, but we don't have to count on that alone, actually. The thing that we can count on is a steady realization that we generally cannot afford to have a divided world, that we are on the brink of an existential crisis based primarily on climate change. We're sitting right now with plus 1.1 degrees. We know that we're going to be at plus 1.5 degrees within the next two decades. I mean, the science is clear. There's no dispute on that at all. We're already having difficulty surviving at 1.1 degrees Celsius, above around half a, half a meter rise in sea level around the acidification of the seas. We are going to be plunging further and further and further into these crises. I hope we don't get sunk in a boiled frog syndrome where we will die out before we can wake up. But within that hope is that we won't, that we'll actually pull it together and organize ourselves to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. And I'm really encouraged around things that are happening in my part of the world. I, I genuinely am, because after decades of non-engagement with these global agendas. Africa is waking up in a phenomenal way. I mean, the new presidency of KHOSC, which is the Committee of Heads of State on Climate Change, and is the only regional body that I know that has such a heads of state committee, is putting its foot forward. I mean, there was an impetus around COP27, and, and there's an even bigger impetus now around COP28 to get a movement in the continent around it. So I think, I think there's a pretty good chance around organizing for the global solidarity to actually take hold, to bring us into a better space. Once we take care of the basic needs, let us satisfy those people with more primal instincts that there'll be plenty of other things that we'll be able to fight about. They won't be short of that. But at least we will organize for one, a reasonable survival of a species. Although the earth does not need us, quite frankly, it, it would be better off without us perhaps. And organizing for at least a framework within which we have a reasonable shot of those SDGs being met, maybe not by 2030, but maybe by 2040, maybe by 2050. But it depends on what you do, actually, more than what I do, because the future is in your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Ilau Kasham, a last word before we close the panel, if you want. I think we disconnected for a second. Word, a last word to close the panel, the last yeah, intervention, yeah. please. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, 
the Arab region is not really a player uh, in this uh, uh, in what is going on between Ukraine and Russia and uh, the rest of uh, the West and of course also uh, uh, Asian countries. Uh, you know, uh, Arab regimes are mostly preoccupied with their survival and they even compromise the quality of uh, life of their beleaguered uh, populations. Uh, I don't really see hope. I don't see a chance that the Arab regimes would uh, would come to their minds and uh, engage in constructive work for their people. I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, what part of the problem in my region is that we don't have civil societies. In the 1940s and 50s, before the beginning of the military coup phenomenon, Arab societies were rising and civil society was taking shape. Eventually, in the 1950s and 60s, and as the result of the successive military coups, the ruling elite destroyed civil society and created uh, uh, spectators. People became spectators and they lost control of their fate. This is the sad, the sad reality in, in my region. Hopefully one day will come when the situation can get better. Thank you very much. Obrigada. É neste misto entre otimismo e pessimismo uh, que terminamos esta sessão. Fernando Jorge, por favor, foi um gosto estar a moderar. Aprendi muito e muito obrigada. <música>